Okay, I just tested the volume and it seemed like it was better. I know in the last two videos for post-impressionism and symbolism, my volume was low and I'm not sure why. I didn't change any settings on my computer, but it seems like that is okay. I'm still gonna try to talk a little bit louder. So if you need to turn me down, don't worry about it. Um, also on those last two, I found that using headphones is, is helpful in being able to hear them. It took a million years to upload, so I'm probably not going to redo them. And as you may recall, I had to redo post-impressionism because of an upload issue. Anyway, hopefully this one is all good. Okay, so first, um, before I get into Fauvism and also German Expressionism, I want to talk about modernism in general for a little bit and kind of the state of the world right now um, as we're coming into this, this era, this modern era, era of uh, artwork. So here's just a map of what Europe looked like after World War I. That'll be our backdrop as we're kind of getting into a little bit of the context of what's going on. Okay, so the first half of the 20th century is a huge period of upheaval. You all know this. If you've read my notes, you understand. You also are probably just aware of all the things that happened between 1900 and 1945. We have World War I. We have World War II. We have the rise of fascism, we have the rise of Nazism, we have the Great Depression, we have the beginning of the Cold War. So there's lots of big things that happen in this time that cause a lot of upheaval and turmoil. Um, so as we've learned through this point, that also means there's a lot of change in the art world, right? Anytime everything's kind of shaking up in the uh, political and economic and social climate, it's reflected then in the artistic development and climate as well. So this is also a really significant period um, in in, of change in, in the Western art world, right? Pretty radical change, pretty substantive change. Um, so I'll post another little lecture that I use in a different class. Um, it's called Isms, and it's about um, kind of the five broad sweeping categories in which we talk about art kind of from this point forward. Um, and, and then it can be applied retroactively. So I'll post that, but basically it's realism, formalism, conceptualism, expressionism, and instrumentalism are kind of the five big isms that I kind of put everything into. Um, so that'll be a side little lecture that I'll, I'll put up that's pretty short that kind of goes into that. But basically painters and sculptors at this time period challenge the basic assumptions about the purpose of art and um, about what art even is, okay? So what form should it be? What should it be about? Can it be about itself? Does the materiality of art impact the subject or the realness of it? Um, so as all these changes are happening, as all these old social orders are kind of collapsing and new ones, all everything from corporate capitalism to communism, all these new things are, are on the rise to replace these old orders. Um, artists kind of have to figure out what all of this change, um, political, social, economic, what all of these big shifts mean for them, okay? So um, there's some fundamental questioning happening, questioning of the nature of art um, and about what kinds of methods of art production are still relevant and challenging the tradition and kind of the status quo, kind of where we're coming in at the end of the 19th century. Um, so all of this kind of bubbles over into a period we call the avant-garde. Um, this literally, it's a French phrase, and it literally means the front guard, and it derives from um, a French military term. And that military term um, in the military, when you're talking about the avant-garde, that's a group of troops that goes ahead and kind of scouts the enemy position and figures out what's going on. Um, so they're, they're literally the head group, the first group of troops that goes out. So first we see politicians in this time period start co-opting this term. And basically they're, they're using avant-garde in political circles to mean that they are um, forward thinking or progressive or visionary. So then in the art world, avant-garde is used pretty heavily in the 1880s. Um, and it's used at that time to refer to the, the realists, the impressionists, and the post-impressionists, all of whom we've talked about. Um, generally, it means artists who are, are ahead of their time. Um, 
Now, looking back on all of this as uh, we study art history, we tend to use the phrase avant-garde to talk about the artists who were making work at the beginning of the 20th century. So its, its application has kind of shifted over time. So many, many movements, many, many isms come out of this uh, time period, and we are going to start by talking about Fauvism. Okay, so in 1905, uh, the third Salon d'Etat, which is the autumn salon uh, in Paris, sees an exhibition by a group of young painters. So these are new painters to the scene outside of the familiar Impressionist and Post-Impressionist. Um, the work is simple in terms of its design, and it's um, incredibly shocking and vibrantly colorful. Okay, so it's it's very a very bright color palette, as you can see by the example of this work I have here. Um, the critic Louis Vassel describes the artist as fauves, which means wild beasts. Okay, so this is another instance when a critic kind of accidentally names something by saying something he meant to be derogatory and knock them down, and then the artists kind of embrace it and are like, yeah, we're fine with this. As you remember, we've talked about that happened with Impressionism, with Baroque. Okay. So, three big things about um, Fauvism that kind of distinguish it from other movements. Um, it takes the directness of Impressionism, the direct application of Impressionism, and it takes... Uh, it takes that and it adds really intense expressive color, like what we saw in some of post-Impressionism. And then it also um, throws in this very rich surface texture. So it really just kind of continues further what was started in post-Impressionism. Um, the idea, the big idea, the big number one idea is to completely liberate color from its function. So I talked, when we talked about uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, when we talked about Van Gogh, when we talked about Gauguin, I was talking about non-local color and this idea of using color for expressive means rather than just using color to imitate what we see. So the Fauves really latch onto this idea and kind of make all of their art about that, okay? So um, they did all kinds of things. They did portraits, they did landscapes, they do still lifes. Um, they never really organize as a group. They show together some, but they're not as um, there's not as, they're not as much of a community in it, like a unit, as say the Impressionists, for example. So basically, the period we refer to as Fauvism lasts about five years. But there's some holdover artists who continue working in the Spain for many years after that. Okay, so the first artist we're going to look at is Henri Matisse. Um, he is born in 1869 and dies in 1954. I could teach an entire class on Matisse. I love Matisse. Matisse is one of the most important artists um, of the 20th century, in my opinion. I'm not alone in that opinion. That's a fairly popular opinion. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. So Matisse believed that color could play a primary role in conveying meaning, okay? Um, he thought that color trumped line, form, shape, and all the other elements of art in terms of its ability to convey information. In this uh, painting, this is called um, Woman with the Hat, Matisse paints his wife Amelie. Um, she's his model for um, quite a lot of his work throughout his life. She and his daughter are both, uh, his daughter's name is Marguerite, I think. They're, they're both models for a lot of his work. Um, so in this we have a fairly conventional kind of composition. It's a seated woman from the waist up. That's pretty common for portraiture, right? Um, but we have this color that just seems totally arbitrary and kind of crazy, right? It's total. It's pretty shocking. So this is to this startles the viewer to get a reaction. Um, the sketchiness of the forms is something that viewers had become sort of accustomed to because this is, you know, in, in 1905, so they've, they've come to grips with this idea of Impressionism. They've come to grips with the idea of post-Impressionism. Um, so this is something they're, they're sort of accustomed to. Um, but this takes Van Gogh's ideas about non-local color to, to an extreme. This seems totally arbitrary and like it has no real connection to reality. Um, okay, so let's look at another Matisse really quick. Uh, this is La Bonne Heure de Vivre. Um, okay, 
let me not get ahead of myself. Let me back up and just talk about Matisse as a person um, and a painter for a while. So um, basically Matisse is really important to me personally um, because of an exhibition I saw when I was probably close to most of your ages. I was, I think, a junior, I think I was a junior, or no, maybe I was a sophomore. I think I was a sophomore uh, in, as an undergraduate in, in college. Um, and I went to this, I went to New York over spring break, New York City, and I went to the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, because I really wanted to see this exhibition. I was studying art history at the time, and I was super interested um, in this exhibition, which was of Picasso and Matisse. And the way the exhibition was arranged was kind of in dialogue, okay? So they have this very interesting relationship, and we'll talk about that more when we talk about Picasso too, but they were, they were great friends. They were also kind of rivals. They were sort of frenemies, I guess you could say, but they have this dialogue back and forth in their work. So the way this exhibition was arranged walking through, you could see what Matisse did and then how Picasso responded, and then what Picasso did and how Matisse responded, because they had this kind of back and forth about their ideas of what modern painting was. And it was a fascinating exhibition. I wasn't already interested in art history. I was super interested in studying it after that. So, so this, this Matisse has like a soft spot in my heart because that was the first exhibition I ever saw where I had a really, a really strong kind of emotional, overwhelming reaction to it. Um, so basically, their relationship is one of the great stories in art history. I'll talk about it more later, but it, it was really interesting to see these works uh, displayed next to each other in this way. Okay, so Matisse. Back on track, Matisse. Uh, he's also a sculptor. He's also a printmaker. Later in his life, he makes works by cutting out paper and gluing it to things. Um, but mostly he's known as a painter. That's kind of his great work. Um, he's one of the artists who really defines the avant-garde and defines the kind of the revolution of the avant-garde in visual art. Um, he was born in Le Cateau, uh, Cabrissi, which is in um, northern France, it's up in northern France. Uh, his dad was fairly wealthy, his father was a, a merchant, a grain merchant. Um, he moves to Paris in 1887. And um, he doesn't come to Paris to study art. He comes to Paris to study, to study law. So he goes to, he goes to law school, um, which can, I just, can you imagine what a tragedy it would be if he was satisfied being a lawyer and we lost one of the most important visual creative voices of all time to something pragmatic and boring like studying the law? Oh, it, it chills me to my soul to think of the loss of a creative mind to, to the world of law. Um, coming as, from someone who was a paralegal for six years in another lifetime. But anyway, so, so he comes to, to Paris in 1887. He studies law. Luckily for us and the art world, he gets appendicitis and he's horribly, horribly ill. So his mother kind of takes care of him and she decides that to recover, a, a good thing for him to do to kind of play with and entertain himself would be to paint. So she buys him paints and, um, Thank you, Matisse's mom. Mrs. Matisse, thank you very much, because he gets really into painting. Um, and that was kind of it. Like, from then on, he was like, okay, painting is what I do. So after his recovery in 1891, he returns to Paris, but this time he comes to Paris to study art. And he goes to um, Académie Julien. Um, he studies under Gustave Moreau. From my symbolism lecture, you may remember Gustave Moreau is the first artist that we talk about. Um, so Matisse studies with him. Uh, he becomes, quite quickly, he becomes very proficient in traditional painting. He's quite skilled at representational type painting. Um, in 1896, he discovers the Impressionists. Um, he discovers them because he stays with a friend, uh, John Russell. John Russell is also a painter. He's also a friend of Van Gogh. And um, Russell kind of opens his eyes to these other kinds of painting, to these ideas about Impressionism and post-Impressionism. He actually gives him one of Van Gogh's drawings, which is something he has uh, in his home for, for his whole life. Um, and it just changes his style completely. It kind of blows his mind. So in 1898, 
he's hanging out with the Impressionists. And under Camille Pissario's advice, he goes to London. Remember, Camille Pissario was one of the Impressionists we talked about. Pissario says, I think with your interest, you need to go to London and you need to look at the paintings of Turner. So if you remember in Romanticism, we talked about Turner, particularly the slave ship, uh, Zong, that threw the, the people overboard. It was really horrible. Um, so he, Matisse goes to London, he studies Turner's paintings, and um, then he returns to Paris. He goes into debt buying art. He buys a plaster bust by Rodin. He has his Van Gogh drawing. He buys um, one of Cezanne's pieces. It's one of his bathers pieces, but one of the smaller, not the big one I showed you, but one of the smaller ones. And that is a huge influence. That painting by Cezanne is a massive influence. And we can see the influence actually in this particular work. Um, and then in 1906, he meets Picasso. Uh, he meets Picasso, and they become lifelong friends and rivals, as I already alluded to. Um, they meet in a, a spot that becomes extremely important in the history of art, and that is the Salon of uh, Gertrude Stein. So Gertrude Stein holds uh, these Salon meetings, these meetings of artists and writers and, and great minds of the time in her home, and they all kind of meet each other and hang out. She's also a great patron of the arts, and she introduces Matisse and Picasso and other artists of the time to people who are who are their patrons. So then they're being paid for their work and they're able to make work. If you see, and I hate to advocate for Woody Allen, I know he's very problematic, but his work, uh, his film, um, Midnight in Paris, if you if you watch Midnight in Paris, Gertrude Stein and her salons make an appearance in there and it's, it's kind of, it's a very charming movie even though it's made by a problematic guy. But anyway, that gives you kind of a glimpse into what's going on. Okay, so, uh, da, 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 da. In 1917, Matisse relocates, he goes and he moves to, um, it's like a suburb of Nice. It's uh, in southern France on the Riviera, and it's not Nice proper, but it's one of the little towns around Nice. And he, his work kind of relaxes at that point. So in 1917, he's kind of gets all the extreme fauve energy out of, out of his system and his work kind of relaxes. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's Matisse in a, in a very brief nutshell. Uh, let's go back to this painting. Um, so what Matisse says about Fauvism is this. He says what characterizes Fauvism is we rejected imitative colors and that with pure colors we obtained stronger reactions. So for Matisse and the Fauves, color becomes the for formal element most responsible for pictorial coherence and for conveying emotion and for conveying whatever content they're interested in expressing. Um, Matisse also said, and I like to throw in quotes from artists as you know at this time so we can kind of learn directly from them. He also said, um, what I am after above all is expression. Expression for me does not reside in the passions glowing in a human face or manifested by violent movement. The entire arrangement of my picture is expressive. The place occupied by the figures, the empty spaces around them, the proportions, everything has a share. Composition is the art of arranging in a decorative manner the diverse elements at the painter's command to express his feelings. So there's really no two ways about it in terms of what camp our friend Matisse falls in in terms of realism, expressionism, formalism, etc. He is very interested in expressionism and, and thinks that that is the highest goal of art making and of painting. Uh, he also, in talking about color, says, the chief function of color should serve expression as well. My choice of colors does not rest on any scientific theory. It is based on observation, on sensitivity, on felt experiences. I simply put down colors which render my sensation. So he talks a lot about kind of an intuitive color choice and an intuitive color choice that is to do with um, reflecting his emotions and how he feels in the color. And I think that you get a sense of that from his work. He has many, many wonderful works. He's very prolific. Um, okay, let's talk about somebody else or I'll just talk about Matisse forever and that is not particularly helpful for this class. <laughs> okay. Uh, Andre Durand. Andre Durand is born in 1880. Uh, he, he dies in 1954. 
Durand and Matisse were friends. They painted together. They talked about their work a lot. You can see the strong influence Matisse had on Durand. Um, he tended to paint more landscapes. He was less interested in the figure than Matisse. Um, he liked to paint en plein air, like the Impressionists, so he liked to paint outside, take his easel outside. Um, and he really liberates color completely from the traditional role of imitating appearance. Um, he uses these short energetic brush strokes, so you can see that he studied Van Gogh in that regard, and also in kind of some of the shapes. You also, to me, can really see the influence of Gauguin because he has these thinner kind of wash-like textures rather than the very thick impasto that we see um, in Van Gogh's work and in uh, some of Matisse's early work. This is just another André Durand. You can really get the sense of vibrancy of the color that he uses. And you can kind of see how he's not interested in color, even sort of having a relationship to what he's actually perceiving. So he really pushes color even further than Matisse. Okay, uh, another artist from this period I want to talk about, this is one of her earlier paintings, kind of before she hooks up with the Fauves. So this is Emily um, Charmy. She She's born um, Emily Barre, but changes her name to Charmy later. Um, she's born in 1878 and she lives until uh, 1974. So as you can see by that date, she made this when she was quite young, she was only 20. Um, so she studied to become a teacher. That was kind of the only option um, for, for, for women at the time in uh, Lyon in France where she was. And she was offered several teaching positions, but she rejected them. She was not interested in that. She thought it was kind of, um, insulting to women that that was one of the only positions that they could have in society if they wanted a career. Uh, in the 1890s, she studies painting at the studio of Jacques Martin. Um, her work with the Fauves was a bit more, she had kind of a different quality. So here's a little later painting of her. She continued painting in kind of the Fauve vein well into her career. So this is a, a, a little later than some of the other Fauve work. As you can see, it was painted in 1921. And you can see that she has some of these similar ideas about abstraction, about like the rough brush strokes, and also about the color being divorced from reality. She also reminds me a little bit of Klimt, the way that she has this abstracted background that kind of makes it to where we don't have any grounding, right? We don't know what kind of a scene or what kind of a setting we are. She, our figure is just sort of floating, okay? Um, so her work with the Fobs is, is a little, she has kind of a more sensual quality. She's a little bit more moody. It's not quite as harsh as, say, uh, Durand. Um, they're very vibrant. They have this abstract quality, and they're kind of uniquely hers. She has a very specific kind of voice. Um, in 1902, she moves from Lyon to Paris, and there she meets Matisse and the other Fauves and, and becomes friendly with them and, and exhibits with them. In 1913, uh, she was one of only 50 women invited to the Armory Show. We'll talk about the Armory Show later. It's a pretty huge exhibition in terms of the history of art. So she was definitely recognized as one of the up-and-coming talented artists from this time period. Okay. Let's switch gears and talk about German Expressionism. Um, so the Phelps have um, a big influence in the art world, even though their, their movement is sort of short-lived and not super organized. They particularly influence two German groups called uh, Die Brücke, which is the bridge, and Der Blau Reiter, which is the blue rider. Um, so they, they kind of get classified, these two groups get classified and talked about together because of the similarities in their style. So we talk about them collectively as the German Expressionists, okay? Um, and this movement is marked by dramatic and emotional canvases. Color still plays a big role, um, like with the Faust, though it's not quite as primary um, to German Expressionism as it is to Faustism. Um, more of the expressive quality comes from distortions of form, ragged, really rough outlines, really rough shapes and, and line usage, and um, tormented brush strokes, just kind of violent brush strokes. So 
uh, texture line are being used in very expressive ways in addition to the use of uh, non-local color. Okay, um, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner is born in 1880 and he lives until 1938. Um, he's a guy, you see his work a lot in museums that have modern sections throughout the world, but if you're in Germany, when I was in Germany a few summers ago, um, every single major museum in Germany has like a whole room of this guy's work. He made a ton of paintings, so he's, he's someone that they're very proud of in their German heritage, uh, which, you know, he's extremely important. So um, he was quite prolific. There's a lot of, a lot of his work is out there. Okay, um, so he is from the uh, Dybruck, uh, the bridge side. He's kind of the leader of that group. Um, they have their first meeting in Dresden in 1905, and he kind of organizes it. They thought of themselves as being kind of the bridge between the old ways and the new ways. But they're very, um, they're very loud about being the youth and the new art movement, but there was some interest within the group, especially with Kirchner, in some older um, modalities of art making. Particularly Kirchner, um, his background is in architecture and he has a love of German medieval art. So when he says the old ways is what he's bridging, he's talking like way old, like hundreds of years ago old, okay? Um, so part of the impetus behind creating the group The Bridge is he's sort of modeling it after medieval guilds, okay? So there were um, medieval craft guilds where different people with different specialties formed together in a guild, like there were the, the weavers who made cloth, they had a guild, the stonemasons had a guild, painters had a guild, that kind of thing. So his interest in um, medieval artwork also led to the organization of this group. Okay, so here's his statement about uh, Dybruck. He says, with faith in process and in a new generation of creators and spectators, we call together all youth. As youth, we carry the future and want to create for ourselves freedom of life and movement against the long established older forces. Everyone who reproduces that which drives him to creation with directness and authenticity belongs to us. So that's a pretty strong declaration, right? He's saying, if you're young and you care about being authentic, you should come be with us. We are the uh, authentic ones. We're the voice of the future. Um, he was extremely critical of industrialization. He felt like people were becoming alienated as cities grew in population. And um, he thought this was creating kind of an impersonal, overly busy society. Um, so this is like, this is also leading right into uh, World War I and he's in Germany. So there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of tension in Germany at this time. Okay, so let's look at this painting. This is called Street Dresden. Dresden is where he was located. Um, and here we have this glance into the frenzied kind of urban activity of a 20th century city. So it's very dense. You have like a trolley car back there. You have people all over. Um, and it's meant to be very uh, jarring and, and dissonant. The color and the texture, everything is supposed to make you uncomfortable when you look at this work. Um, the color palette and the composition are both kind of put together to make you uncomfortable. You notice some references to um, Impressionism, how we have a figure cut off. So that's kind of that influence of photography and how the composition works. So the, the implication is that there's lots and lots of people kind of pressing in from the outside as well. Um, the figures look kind of ghoulish. Look at this little girl with this insane, like, I don't know, monster plant for a hat and her arm looks distended and hanging down. And I mean, it's kind of frightening looking, right? Um, so we have these kind of ghoulish figures and they're staring directly at us, okay? So it's, it's kind of confrontational. It's much more confrontational than some of the works that we've seen in Impressionism, for example. So... He also, he kind of reminds me of our, our sad friend Munch, who we talked about, Edvard Munch, and how there's this feeling of, um, 
there's there's this feeling of psychic disturbance, as Munch would say. There's this feeling that something is is wrong, and there's this kind of tension in the work. But it's more confrontational because they're looking right at us, right? They're not looking up or off to the side like like Munch would do. Um, okay, let's look at the other branch of uh, German expressionism. Um, this is Vasily Kaminsky. He's born in 1866 and lives until 1944. He's actually born in Russia, but he moves to um, Munich, Germany in 1896. Um, and he is in the Der Blue Reiter group. So he's in the, the Blue Rider group. He, his ideas are quite different from Kirchner's. I mean, you can kind of just see in, in the styles, but, but they have some similarities as well. He develops a more spontaneous, expressive kind of style um, that's a little less stilted than Kirchner. Um, and in his work, as you can see by looking at this, there isn't really um, a figural component. Abstraction kind of is the subject, right? So he's, rather than taking abstraction and abstracting techniques and applying them to a subject matter, he's more making work that is about abstraction itself and is totally divorced from representation. So that's a pretty new idea, right? That's, that's something we haven't really seen before. Um, so he's very interested in just exploring abstraction itself as the subject. Um, he uses musical references as titles for his paintings, like this one is uh, Improvisation 28. Um, he's interested in theosophy, which is, it's kind of akin to a religious study. Um, it's, it has elements of mysticism. It's quite popular at the time. Um, Helma F. Klint is another artist we'll talk about later who, who is very involved in it. But it's, it's this idea that has a lot to do with how our perception works. It's, it's some of the same stuff that the symbolists were really interested in. Um, and he's also very interested in science. He's very interested in scientific developments. He understood scientific theories. He was, he was an intellectual. He was very well read. Um, because of this, these two things, uh, theosophy and his interest in, in new scientific theories, he becomes convinced that material objects have no real substance. Okay. And in 1912, he writes concerning spiritual art. Um, and in this book, he talks about his belief that artists needed to express their feelings through color, form, and line, and not mimic nature. He didn't think that that was a good goal for art or a good way to use art. Um, he was friends with composer Arnold uh, Schoenberg and theorized with him about the relationship between sound and color. He was very interested in, he thought that there was a relationship there. So you can see in this, we have the same kind of rough, rugged kind of linear elements that we see with Kirchner, that we see with most German Expressionism. We have the bold color, but the big thing is that it's totally divorced from um, any goal of mimicry or representation. So that is a big development that we get with Kandinsky. Another big guy at this time that um, I'm sort of skipping over because I'm gonna have one of you write about him, is uh, Franz Marc. So one of you will, will write about Franz Marc. He kind of continues uh, Kandinsky's ideas and, and pushes in that direction further. Um, another artist from this time period I want to talk about is uh, Kathy Kolwitz. She's born in 1867. She dies in 1945. Um, she's a German expressionist. Um, and she employs a great range of emotions. So in her work, um, we, we see a lot of themes, not just on anxiety and not just political ideas, but also personal work and personal um, ideas about sadness, um, particularly. She studies at the um, Union of Berlin uh, Women's Academy alongside Paula Mordeson Becker, who one of you is writing about Paula Mordeson Becker. So in Germany, there are specific places for women to go study at this time and go study art, and she takes advantage of that. Um, she's interested in using artwork to express overtly political ideas. She did a lot of things about labor reform, for example. Um, but she also, like I said, a lot of her work is deeply personal, like um, this piece. So in this work, Woman with Dead Child, 
she's kind of thinking about the Pieta. Remember, um, we looked at Michelangelo's Pieta with the Virgin Mary holding the her dead son, holding the dead Christ after he's come down off the crucifixion. So she's interested in this um, motif of the Pieta in this theme in artwork, but she's interested in making it more um, universally relatable and, and relatable to all women and all parents, but particularly women, and, and this idea of the loss of a child. Um, so she's very interested in grief. Grief is one of the, the, the themes in her work, um, and she explores it a lot. Uh, in this version of this, which she does several of these, this is an etching, um, and rather than having the, the kind of reverence that we see in usually in the Pieta, usually Mary is sad, but it's it's also reverence. This is her son who is also God, and there's this kind of, um, I don't know, it, it's not quite as, as personal of a connection, it feels like, in them. So here, she's not so much interested in that aspect as she's interested in um, anguish and, and in, in kind of a primitive passion, something very like primal about losing a child and, and being overcome with grief. So that's what the subject of this work is. Very sadly, she um, outlives her son. Her son was the model for this, but he dies uh, in, I think in World War I in um, 1921. So he, he dies uh, a little later um, on not in 1921, in 1917. I can't remember. Her son dies before her, and it's in a war, and it's sad. So this sort of, almost this body of work kind of predicts that loss, which is, is horrible and, and sad. But I think that she's interesting because she is able to capture the emotion and some of the ideas of German Expressionism with a much more muted palette. So I think that it's interesting to see these ideas at the time that she was around and creating with translated into this very different kind of artwork. Okay, uh, we'll end with Egon Schiele. Um, he is born in 1890, he dies in 1918. Um, he dies young, but he's very prolific. He produces over 3,000 works. Um, he's kind of a controversial guy like some of the other people we've talked about this semester, he spends time in jail. He spends time in jail for immorality ch charges. Um, basically, a lot of his works were nudes, and so he was arrested for having pornography, essentially. Um, but after more research, it's come out that it might have been something much darker than that. Uh, there's some allegations that he assaulted someone and maybe kidnapped a underage person. So he's not a good dude, um, but he is kind of interest, interesting in terms of uh, art history. So most of his work is, are, are nude studies of men and women, um, and they're done in gouache and watercolor on paper. Um, he created around 150 self-portraits, including this one, um, and his work is very influenced. He had trauma um, at a young age, he watched his father die very slowly and very painfully of syphilis. His father died when he was 15, and that had a deep impact on him. And he was kind of interested in human suffering. It was one of the things that he was he was interested in. He studies at um, Vienna's Acad Academy of Fine Art. He was a protege of Gustav Klimt, who we looked at when I talked about symbolism. Um, they exhibit together along with Van Gogh and Munch, and you can see maybe some influence from that ex exhibition as well. He was very interested in the work of Edvard Munch and of Vincent Van Gogh. Um, his figures are often kind of elongated, they're kind of twisted, um, and part of that is because he was also interested in Rodin, the sculptor, and Rodin famously talked about when he was first getting ready to do something and he was looking at the model, he would do what's called automatic drawing, where you draw continuously, not looking at the paper, you just look at what you're drawing. And so um, Sheely applies that to pretty much all of his work. He just looks at what he's drawing and doesn't really look at the paper when he's initially drawing it. So we get these kind of weird, contorted sort of looking figures, and then he goes back and works back into them. Um, part of this twisted kind of bodily look is, is he sort of, um, he kind of viewed himself as a martyr. 
He um, talked a lot about how he suffered greatly psychologically and also physically, um, and he imbued his work with, with some of that energy, which is one of the reasons we kind of think about him in terms of the uh, German expressionists. Um, he did some portraits of himself as St. Stephen, which if you're familiar with St. Stephen, he's always shown with all the arrows piercing his skin. So he definitely viewed himself as, as kind of a martyr. Um, he dies of the Spanish flu um, at the age of 28 in 1918. So he dies quite young, but he makes a ton of artwork and is, is pretty influential in terms of his style. Um, okay. That is the first module of modernism.